You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. We're going to finish chapter 1 of uh, James this morning, so we'll be looking at verses 19 through 27. So, um, before we start, though... uh, I'm not going to address all of this this morning, but I have had some questions about going over some things like end time stuff. Uh, is there? Do any of you here pay attention to things and look at headlines and stuff and think what's going on is like end time stuff? Anybody? No? Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Ho- hopefully it's because you've been had listened to some of, some of the things that I've taught in the last couple of years, but or the different views. But um, uh, if there's any more interest in that, I'll, I'll go over it. There's some that were ra- I mean, Dad and I were raised, like, I mean, any time. I was always afraid of being left behind and all that stuff in the rapture. So, right? And, like, they made us watch that movie, uh, The Thief in the Night. Like, in our youth group, like... And then they were like, Ew. so anyway. But right now, the big thing in the, in is because of Russia and Ukraine. Um, a lot of people are saying that's either the start or is Gog and Magog that's in the Bible. And what they say um, is because the Hebrew word Rosh, they say it's Russia which is a very large, long stretch there. Uh, you can't really do that to words. Um, that's like me saying Mark sounds like Steve. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, Rosh just means head. Um, it could mean a head of something, but <clears throat> there there was the Jewish, fe- there's Rosh uh, Hashanah and stuff like that too. Gog and Magog is in Ezekiel uh, near the, uh, it's 37 and 38 or 38 and 39. Um, you could actually find its fulfillment in the Old Testament as well, uh, of it happening. And then this, um, John mentioning, it, uh, mentioning Gog and Magog as symbolism in, in the book of Revelation, saying, hey, that destruction is going to be like what happened there. Um, so whether it's, uh, you know, my, my view is that Russia and Ukraine is not that war. And, of course, most of you know my view is uh, we're nowhere in that time period, that timeline at all. So, <laughs> um, I, I don't take that. Uh, I'm not in times uh, crazy like I used to be. I used to be until I started to learn how to read the Bible, and then I was like, oh, so, so okay. One of the things that um, after you said that, when Tom was talking with the, one of the men at that stop where Heron mm-hmm. and he was he, so he must have been following all that. <laughs> Oh, yeah? Oh, a lot of people do. Well, I had a woman the other day. Uh, she was like, we're living in the in biblical times. I was like, no, we're, we're not living in... You mean we're living in end times? I was like, we're not living in biblical times. <laughs> I was making a joke, but... And I was like, no, I don't think so. She asked me my honest opinion. I said, no, I don't think so. She's like, oh, well, I don't think so either. And I was like, well, then why did you say it? And she's like, I don't know, I guess because most people think that. So... <laughs> Anyway, um, the, 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 the main question was about the mark, the beast, and, and the beast himself. And I pointed out that, you know, the future, futurist says we're finally in a time that allows that technology to exist. But if you think logically, you, didn't, you don't need technology uh, for that to exist. They had ways of marking and keeping track of people, even in the Old Testament times. So um, also the mark had this, has to do with temple worship. And 
um, so which strictly was t would take place in the temple and you pledge your allegiance to uh, either the God there or uh, then uh, the one who wanted to be God, like God was uh, the, the beast or Caesar. Um, and it was symbolism, the right hand, the forehead is symbolism as well. Um, but John gives a great, a great clue in Revelation 13. Um, and I could paraphrase it, but I'm going to look it up real fast and then we'll start. We've gone over this before, but uh, you may not remember and don't want to, you've not heard all my takes on it, but <laughs> it's not my take either, but it's something, but um, so I don't want to freak you out, but, but he, he says uh, at the end of Revelation 13, he says, this calls for wisdom, to have wisdom. So he's saying, hey, have wisdom. And he says, let the one who has understanding. So if you're reading this, when you receive this first and the audience revel uh, revelants, you have understanding, calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So he says, you can calculate his number to see that he is a man. It's a Hebraic equation, and you would take the Hebrew alphabet and count 600 and then 66, and it sp spells out Neron Kaiser, which was Nero Caesar at that time. And historically, if you watch a documentary on Nero, his nickname was the Beast. Uh, so, <laughs> coincidence? You know, is it a, uh, a a hill I'm willing to to, to die on? No, um, but I don't think we need to get t uh, tied up in all the the craziness sometimes that that takes place with when it comes to the end, the end, the end. I don't know what why the hype is there anyway because. Most people who believe the end is coming believe they're going to be raptured out before anything bad happens in the first place. So it's just like, why are you so obsessed with it? <laughs> you won't even be here. Why are you, and why are you scared? Or why are you freaked out? So, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so there's a little tidbit on that. Anyway, going from there, we'll go and finish chapter one of James. And so far in this letter... We've been given an examination of trials. We've seen where wisdom comes from um, to gain a better footing, if you will, to withstand and to continue through all these things that happen in our life, which is it's God's word going to him in prayer and faith. And this also results in a maturing of us and, and spiritually. And if you have a maturing spiritually, that's only natural that it's just going to show and your actions and your reactions in your life. We also saw last week that most most things concerning sin are a result of our inner workings, that lust, and it was giving birth to sin. And so much of this and what we're going to see is just action and reaction. And so we've we've all heard the sayings, we've all said it ourselves too, that like before you speak, listen, <laughs> right? Speak less. You know, think, think before you talk. Be slow to anger, right? We hear these things, we say them, and, and it's all for good reason. Um, the thing is, uh, and this I'm including myself, I, I don't know how often we actually practice that, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> it's basically, he's going to be like, hey, walk the walk, talk the talk here, okay? So 19 through 20, it says, know this, my beloved brothers, let, let every person be quick to hear, Okay, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. <clears throat> the, the verses we looked at last week dealt with temptation. Okay, and then it dealt with the goodness of God. So in light of that, you stay, take that in context. We, we must take special care then to be slow to anger, he says, because it cannot, it does not accomplish the righteousness of God. 
So when he says, know this, when he starts in verse 19, uh, there's different translations. It can also uh, be, so then, or this you know. And the point is, is that it, the way he says this is people, people know, like the people he was writing to know, we should know that we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, right? Um, but he's still inspired to pin these words and to let them know, to remind them again and make it a point that this is something that should be practiced. So when James says to be quick to hear, he's talking about being quick to receive God's word and receive that in a way like that's today. It's by hearing, right? Um, but it's also by reading. So, but then it was strictly for New Testament hearing. Okay, they gathered together and, and they would read these out loud. But listening, listening to God's word was to take the place of, of, of much speaking. I wouldn't say speaking in general, but, but it's to take the place of speaking in anger. And the anger here is an anger that one feels and experiences in these trials he's been talking about um, and what we have seen. And the producing the righteousness of God is the whole point of going through the trial, right? The joy that awaits you, right? Count it all joy. Therefore, we should be quick to hear or read in whichever manner to receive God's word. But we need to make a point to be slow to speak. And the reason is uh, because of that is we talk, we talk to ourselves, right? We talk to others about why something is happening or has happening happening or what's going to happen and how we should respond and how to deal with it. Now, it's okay. I, I've said I, I, I've made it a point to say, like, I'm not saying don't do these things, but we naturally want to put that above going for the wisdom that God has provided us, right? We, we, we talk so much, in fact, that we can stop listening. You're not going to hear, right? Especially if you get your mind made up on something. Nothing's going to change your mind on that. So, so then James gives us that, that secret, if you will, to receiving God's wisdom in a trial. In verse 21, he says, Re receive uh, God's word in meekness. All right, the meekness is humility. He says to, re uh, to, to receive it in that way. Receive God's word in humility. So we have to humble ourselves. We... Eliminate the pride from our response to what's happening in the trial. You can even you you would take take the stance of well I don't deserve anything in reality, right? God doesn't owe me anything. I have nothing good in me except for Christ in me, right? This trial is good for me. It's going to produce maturity. It's one of those things, you know, why? What, why? We, we, we always want to wonder why. And that, that's natural. It's natural. But when you, when you look and you see that God sent his son... <laughs> And they planned it before the foundation of the world to be the sacrifice and, and to, to be a pro, pro, pi, pi, I can't talk, propitiation, propitiation for our sins that, he, you know, he sought us. He sought us. But he, he doesn't owe us anything. He could have just let, he could let us suffer. He could let us go through these trials. I'm just rambling because my mind just went to those things for a moment. <laughs> But what I want you to, to, to notice here is, did anybody notice in verse 21, it says, receive with meekness the implanted word. All right? James refers to this as being implanted in us already. All right? It's something that's already been granted to us. He says the word of God is implanted in you, which is the word that saves. 
God's word is the way we are saved. And the word, the word is also uh, how a, pers- a person who lives in us, it's Christ in us, it's the Holy Spirit. And we receive that word when we turn to it, when we seek his counsel over our own voice, over our own emotions. Then we start to understand our circumstances from a different perspective, right? I don't know if we can ever understand them from his perspective. I doubt that. But we get a better understanding of it when we seek his counsel. The catch, though, if you will, is that once we have done that, we are to act upon it, right? It's the walk the walk, talk the talk part that I mentioned. That's a lot of what he's going on to say here. So 22 through 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he, is, what he was like. But the one who looks into the, the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So James says, prove yourselves as doers of the word. Demonstrate through action and reaction. And in the context of trials, it refers to to, uh, living according to God's word in the midst of those trials. We must receive God's word as doers, not merely as hearers. To, To take comfort in the fact that you have heard God's word when you haven't Uh, You haven't done it is to deceive yourself, he says. All right. And that word uh, that he uses, this Greek uh, observe has this ideal of careful scrutiny when he's talking about looking in the mirror. Right. Careful scrutiny. So he, he. James is referring to people who give careful scrutiny of God's word. They may be regarded as theologians or scholars or Bible experts, but it still doesn't result in doing. There's fantastic people out there that know so much about biblical interpretation and theology, and they're not even, they're not even self-proclaimed Christians. They have just studied the word of God. They know Greek. They know Hebrew. They know it and can ex- give you the, the background uh, the culture, uh, all the historical stuff, and you can learn so much from it. But as it being, as it actually being the living, breathing word of God, it's not to them, it's just history. But they can break it down to you and and, and see they've they've heard it. They've They've received it, but they've not put it into action. It's not done anything to them. That's like the man that looks in the mirror, walks away and just forget what he saw, right? So it is careful scrutiny. So it, it, that doesn't result, though, in the doing, as I said, right? So a healthy person, he, he looks in the mirror, you do something. And most of us don't like to stare at ourselves in the mirror too long, <laughs> right? You're going to see something there, there. I don't like that. I don't like this. Or, you know, this is crooked, whatever. You know, I didn't trim my mustache right. I didn't trim it right last week. That's why it's so short now because it was like, I was like, ah. <clears throat> like look we look into it we do something right you're, you're looking into it to to fix something to do your hair whatever you, you're not admiring your image most of the time i hope you guys aren't that <laughs> that into yourselves <laughs> right? you okay but even so a healthy christian looks into god's word to do something about it, to do something with it, not to just store up facts that he's never going to use. So if we look into the mirror of God's word, we need to come with this honest heart that's ready to learn something about ourselves because you will learn about yourself. And if we learn something from that self-examination or inspection, then you have to put it into action, right? I've said many times, if, if there's something 
you think or you believe and you start getting into the word and you're like, man, that doesn't line up. Well, then you have to get rid of what you think and believe and align it with the word of God. And it can be hard sometimes. But James says to look in to that mirror, the mirror of God's word, which is the perfect law of liberty, he says. That, that word look means to actually stoop down. Stoop down to inspect, to get a better look, to study intently. So we're, we're looking at this entire truth of Scripture. And the law of liberty, which is not the law of, of Moses, it's the entirety of God's Word. It's the full measure of God's revelation that brings freedom and it brings grace. And it's a power to, fi- uh, to face your trials successfully. So you have to remember that the original audience here, James's audience, they were Jews who had recently come to faith and learned they were no, no longer compelled to keep that entire law of Moses, right? All 613. Because in the new covenant, God reveals to us law, but it's this law of liberty. It's written on our transformed hearts, and it's by the Spirit of God. So all that would had raised a, pre, a problem for, for some who now wondered if they had any obligation to do anything in response to their faith. They were still willing to hear God's word, but they had come to think that the only proper re- response was to keep Mosaic law. But if the law was no longer requirement, then what do they do? James says you stoop down, you inspect it, you st- you study it, learn God, God, learns God's word intently. You stare into that perfect word. You abide by it. And such a man then is blessed in what he does when he's a doer. So the context of this chapter uh, is facing trials. And that context, uh, in that context, being a doer means being someone who puts God's wisdom and instruction into action. And when you put God's word and instruction into action, he says you'll be blessed by it. Now, I'm not going to say you're going to be blessed with money and and prosper, you know, be uh, health and wealth. You're blessed and you can be blessed uh, without any material things. You get peace. You get more comfort in your mind. Right. In your soul, in your heart, if you will, you're blessed. He doesn't say in what way you'll be blessed, but you'll be blessed. But if you hear from God in his word, consider it. But you never take the steps to actually put it into action into your own life, then you're a forgetful hearer, he says. And ironically, if we we even get busy in church, doing church things, right? Serving in one way or another, but we never take the word of God and actually apply it in our own lives, we may feel like we're the doer, that James is asking, telling us to be, but in reality, we're just the actual forgetful hearers. So we're, we're, we're still the one who looks at ourselves and instead of hearing and taking steps to adjust our life to, to Christ, we're distracting ourselves by works at religion and uh, at doing Christian things, right? Instead of being a Christian. There's plenty of people in the church who aren't Christians. And they, and they would look like they're doers of the word. <laughs> 26 and 27, this is it. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. James says if, if someone thinks he's already achieved the perfect reflection in the mirror that he's talked about, they can look upon God's word, they hear it, and they come away thinking, there's nothing, there's nothing else I need to change in my life. Then, then that, that Christian is the one who thinks himself religious. Uh, and that word is negative a lot of times. I understand that now. Uh, even in the New Testament, r- religious it has negative connotation. All right. But he gives you what true religion is here. But this is religion, he says. So, but this person says, uh, everything is good. I've gone through this. Everything is good. So to that person, you would say, well, can you bridle your tongue? 
right? Is, is everything you say to yourself, everything you say to everyone else, perfectly in accordance to God's word? You never lie, you never gossip, gossip or slander, you never utter a hurt, hurtful word or even think it. You never speak out of pride or arrogance. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> If we can't even control something as small as our tongue, <laughs> never mind the rest of our bodies, then we deceive ourselves if we think there's nothing in our lives that we need to change in response to God's word. And in trials, we're going to fail rather than be blessed because we're going to rely on our own thoughts, our own instincts. Your walk with God is useless. If it does not translate into the way you live and the way you treat others, he says. So if you want a picture of what pure religion looks like to God, a pure response to God's word, it involves an external and an internal change. But externally, it takes the form of ministering to those who have nothing to offer in return. He mentions uh, the orphans and widows. They have nothing to give you. They are in a time of distress themselves, right? And finally, the inward change is to keep oneself unstained by the world, he says. He says to stare at God's word, compare it to the reflection of your own life, and be prepared to make the necessary changes to conform yourself to the one who is revealed within its pages. And we'll end there. Because uh, I didn't want to start the, a, new, a new chapter. So is there any questions, comments, disagreements?